ourselves a little bit closer to uh, the relational algebra optimizer uh, by first talking a bit about equivalencies of relational algebra expressions. Now, before I do that, uh, this is the last class before the Project One deadline. Um, just as a reminder, between Sunday and Monday, the midnight between Sunday and Monday is when, uh, when the project is due. Uh, if you have any questions, now would be the time to ask. And while I'm on the subject, uh, due to some internal group conflict, uh, there is uh, there are, um, there's one person looking for a, a group. Uh, is so if there are any two-person groups uh, who would be willing to take on a third at this point? Um, please give me a shout after class. Um, all right. So uh, that said, are there any? Right, this is your last chance to ask questions to me in person uh, before the project is, is due. So, so everyone is is completely happy with the project. We're going to get an, at least a ninety, right? I sense hesitation. Um, are, are you hesitant about uh, being able to complete things, or are you hesitant about not understanding things? Okay. All right. Well, um, seems like that is. Um, what what sort of. Uh, where 
where we can take the join over to file scans and turn that into what we call an index nested loop join. And the idea is essentially that um, once you scan one side of the join, so every time for, for every tuple of R, you have a concrete value of R of A. And as a consequence, you can use an index scan to essentially find uh, the, the set of S of B, the, the set of rows of S, that satisfy this predicate for that particular value of R A. Um, so what you end up doing is essentially uh, performing a uh, repeated scan um, over the index. So you repeat, uh, you look at every tuple of R using a file scan as normal. And then for every tuple uh, that is returned by the index scan on S, you uh, emit the joint tuple. Uh, does everyone follow how, how this is sort of a variant of the nested loop join that uses, uh, that uses index scan? Or So let's uh, let me uh, let me ask you ask this. Um, and we'll, we'll probably get back we'll get back to this uh, in in a little while. So, uh, yeah, so still, uh, yeah. So you still have a file. You're still iterating over every tuple in R. Um, it's entirely possible that you will not encounter uh, any matching tuples. But at the very least, the inner loop uh, is only iterating over those tuples that match, or those, tu uh, those tuples that are extremely likely to match. So you're essentially just replacing the inner loop. Uh, you're, you're sort of retrieving only those tuples that match for the inner loop. OK, so any, any questions on indexes? All right, let's move on to today's topic, which is optimization. Now, the, the core idea of optimization in, in a relational database, or at least the, the main uh, premise, is that you can take a query, uh, let's say expressed as a relational algebra uh, expression, and there are various ways of rewriting that relational algebra expression. Um, and depending on how you rewrite it, depending on how you restructure it, the relational algebra, as, as you've seen in, in project one, the relational algebra algebra plan uh, corresponds pretty much directly to how you execute the, the query. Um, so by rewriting the relational algebra expression, you're essentially uh, restructuring how you evaluate the query. And by figuring out a set of equivalencies, by figuring out we, uh, how we can determine the two, uh, how we can transform one relational algebra expression into an equivalent one, uh, we can sort of scan these, these equivalent, um, we can look at all of the, the possible equivalent uh, representations of the query and come up with one that we think can be evaluated the most uh, efficiently. And as we'll see, there are a couple of these rewrites that are always useful, uh, pushing down selections and projections, for example, and we'll uh, see those in a little bit. Uh, there are some rewrites that also, uh, that could improve the situation, but they could also uh, worsen it. And we'll see a couple of examples of that, uh, the most evident of which is uh, join reorder. Um, we'll probably get to that on Monday. Uh, so again, the, the big question is how do we get to these equivalent forms? How do we determine, uh, how do we take a query, a, a relational algebra expression, and figure out that something else is equivalent? Well, before we do that, we first need to figure out, uh, we need to define what it means for two queries to be equivalent. We need some sort of uh, expression that tells us that this is one type of query and that's another. So from the very top, we have um, a handful of interesting properties about these various relational algebra operators. So for example, uh, the selection predicate uh, is combinable. If you have a conjunction of multiple terms in your selection predicate, you can break that apart into multiple uh, smaller uh, selections, one for each predicate. Uh, does everyone follow why that's the case? So what happens if you have, um, what happens if uh, CN is violated? This entire expression will be false. 
so how does that translate into um, how does that, that so the the, tup, the corresponding tuple of R will be removed? Um, how does that translate into uh, the corresponding tuple of R being removed on the right hand side? Yeah, so that that will that will kill it. What about if both uh, C1 and C3 are false? C3 will kill it. Uh, and once it's killed, it's already gone, so you don't need to uh, care about what C1 is. There's also, selection is also what's known as commutative. If you've taken uh, linearly algebraic expressions, um, the idea is that you can swap the order of selections and it doesn't matter. Um, once again, if uh, C1 is violated but C2 isn't, um, what happens there? So, yeah, so you can, uh, C1 is still applied. You, both of those predicates have to be satisfied in order for the tuple to make it out of those selection predicates. And it doesn't matter what order you check them in. Okay, um, so projection also has this combinability property. Um, what happens if we project down to A, B, and C here? and this projects down to just A. Right, so you only, you only end up outputting A. You only care about the last projection in this sequence. Uh, note, however, that you can go both ways. Um, if you project down to A, there's nothing to stop you from introducing another projection inside it uh, that projects down to A, B, and C. Sorry? Uh, so whatever the columns of A1 are will be the columns in the output. Uh, the columns of the output correspond directly to the columns of A1. Ah, oh, okay. So you can uh, you can only introduce supersets. Uh, a n must be a superset of A1. Otherwise, it, uh, otherwise this wouldn't be a valid expression. You can never uh, a projection. It is not valid to project down to a set of columns uh, that is a. Uh, so uh, pi of r. Uh, if r has columns a, b, then project a c of r. This doesn't make sense, and this is not a valid. Expression. So as long as the nested expression is valid, then that's okay. All right. Um, so the last one is cross product, uh, which actually is very similar to join. Uh, they both have, uh, they're both almost identical in, in nearly every way. Um, join is associative, so you, the order of operations doesn't matter. Um, if I join S and, excuse me, if I join S and T first, and then join R with that, that's equivalent to first joining R and S, uh, and then joining that result with T. It's also commutative, so you can flip the order uh, as you see fit. And in fact, why don't we, why don't we try proving something here? Um, so how do we show that, so starting from R join S join T, how do we get to T join R and that whole thing join S? Using a set of equivalencies, how would we get from here to there? So commute uh, T and, uh, sorry, commute S and T. So R join T join S. Associated and then T is R. So R join T join S. All right, that was a warm-up example. Yes. Projection uh, this thing. Sure. Um, the projection, uh, uh, merging of projections. Sure. So the question is, uh, can I? Uh, so 
So let's start with some relation R, which has uh, attributes A, B, and C. Now if I project down to um, A and B of R, I can then also project this down to just A. And that's equivalent to getting rid of, essentially you can merge those together and just end up with the one. Um, if you have more complex expressions in here, you can still do the merging. Um, it involves, uh, so for a slightly more complex example of, of this, if you have, for example, project um, A, B plus C,
we have a perfect example right up here. Sorry? Um, so the um, what, uh, I think you say that again. So, so swap for each right swap A and C. Okay, so swap the projection with the selection. Well, you can't just uh, spontaneously create projections, but what can you do? Point it back up. So what can you do? Ah, okay, so you can introduce a projection. What is that projection? A union. A union the columns of B. So, uh, sorry, uh, C. So in this case, A and B. Okay, so you can split apart the projection into two separate projections. And now? Yeah, oh, sorry, so select B for A, this part doesn't change. And now? Okay, so now that we know that this is guaranteed to contain all of the columns of, of the selection predicate, they're guaranteed to be compatible, so you can swap them. Now that, you know, maybe I have 
have an index that's capable of answering that. Uh, for example, if I have an index on uh, both a tree index on both uh, R of B and R of A, then that might be a perfectly uh, legitimate thing to do. But what if we're just what if we have a hash index on one of those two, or a hash index on both? Yes. Well, uh, we can first decompose that selection. Okay. We're going to take the selection and we're going to break it apart into two parts. And that's by a thick bar from an S. Well, the, again, I'm going to be very nitpicky here. The selection that we have immediately outside is the, uh, is the inequality. A is greater than 3. Ah, so selectivity commutes. Basically, what I'm trying to get you uh, to go through here is that any sort of transformation, there has to be some sort of precise rule behind it. And each of these rules we've proven to be true. And what I'm trying to get you is uh, that you can build up more complex rules out of these simpler rules. You're, you're, you can essentially prove that the, uh, the more complex rules um, are equivalent to a set of transformation, uh, of simpler uh, transformation. Yes. Uh, okay, and and combine uh, those two. Okay. Good. Any questions on that? Um, okay. So uh, there is. Uh, another rule I'm going to throw at you, namely that uh, selection is uh, commutes with the cross product. So I can take a selection operator and I can push it into uh, the cross product. Uh, and once again, only if the resulting expression has uh, uh, yes. In the previous slide, uh, why we don't use inequality first? Like why did we swap the condition? Sorry. Uh, why did we swap the inequality with equality? Uh, why did we swap the inequality with the equality? Yeah. Uh, so the formal. Uh, so the question is why? Why do we have uh, this this uh, step here where we swap the equality with the inequality? And uh, the reason for that is that this rule looks at a specific um, uh, a specific a specific expression or a specific uh, template, if you will. Um, so I could look at. This, this particular expression matches that template, which means I can rewrite this into um, R join S on the inequality. Um, now, it's, it's sort of intuitive to, uh, to you and me that, yeah, you can take the selection and, um, and put it in the join, but that's only because selectivity, uh, the, the selection operator commutes with itself. And so this, this is sort of, uh, Formalizing that. This is basically our, our way of sort of explicitly saying this template is equivalent to this template, and now this template is equivalent to this this template. Or, sorry, this. Uh, like, has it got uh, something to do with uh, indexes? Like, whenever I will be evaluating such type of queries, so like, if I equality, I will be uh, able to value oh. faster. Yeah. So um, it's okay. So the. Maybe I, I misunderstood the. Uh, are you asking why you can't do R join S on um, the inequality? R of A is greater than 3. Uh, yeah. Um, well, so, first off, the R of A, uh, there, that doesn't help you with S. Uh, this, if you have an index on R of A, that's perfectly helpful. Um, the, so in general, you want a joint condition to be uh, between two different, uh, between one at least one attribute of each relation. Um, otherwise, you're just better off using the, the selection itself. Well, uh, actually, hold that thought for about two, one or two slides. Um, you can actually do better than, than the right hand side there. Uh, and if you have an appropriate index structure. You can do even better than that. Um, 
But yeah, so uh, essentially you, you could do this. If there was a inequality here between R of A and R of B, or I don't know, R of A and S of if, C, uh, if S had an additional column C, uh, if there was some inequality here that took a value from both R and S, that would be a perfectly reasonable thing to do, uh, especially if you had some sort of uh, algorithm in mind for uh, evaluating that efficiently. Uh, we will get to that over the course of the next week, uh, how you pick between those. Okay. Um, right. So, actually, this is the slide I was talking about. So, um, if the selection predicate uh, refers to attributes from only one of the two inputs to the cross product, you can push that selection predicate into, uh, into that side of the, the cross product. So, as a uh, uh, simple example, um, ah, right. So, as a simple example, um, let's show that this. This also applies to joins. So given this, this particular rule, how can you prove that the same rule also applies to joins? Trying to 
tricky though, too. Uh, the selection out of the uh, 
the join, then uh, okay, so selection and projection commute, and then you can push the uh, projection into the cross product, and that, as uh, as an aside, that actually here, uh, let me demonstrate that. Um, so we we write this as uh, projection uh, A select C of R join S, and then we try and do this. Uh, this commute uh, into select C of project A, we actually get that property that uh, you mentioned. So uh, this is only the case if you don't project away uh, attributes relevant to this join. And we actually get that from this, this transformation, because this uh, projection only commutes with selection if you have, uh, if the projection doesn't project away uh, columns that are, are relevant to that selection. Um, okay, so that leads me to my next question. What if we have a query like this? Uh, where relations have a lot of columns.
known as uh, pushing down projections. And once again, this is something that, uh, that is usually quite useful. You want projections evaluated as early as possible. Okay, and we are actually running out of time, so why don't I finish uh, with one quick uh, additional note. Um, just like join, union and intersection are, are both commutative and associative operations. And uh, as it turns out, selection and projection um, also both commute with uh, union. Um, the book has more details on that. Um, but essentially, you can use those to prove an even wider array of, of possible things. Uh, so with that, any questions up to this point? Any last minute questions on the project? Yes. What would be the owner's test time? So I will give you one thing, and that uh, that I have mentioned to a couple of people, uh, and then several people have already discovered. Um, none of the test cases thus far uh, test for group by aggregates. Or none of the test cases that you have test for group by aggregates. All right, any other questions? Well, if not, then um, good luck on the project. And once again, if there are any groups of uh, three people, uh, two people, who uh, would be willing to take on a new member for uh, project two, if not project one, um, then please see me after class. With that, uh, thanks a lot. Welcome to the project.